Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I've actually been here for about seven months now. So this is all kind of new to me. And uh, I was tell, telling Cheryl earlier, you know, we've driven by, uh, you know, the museum a lot and we've never come in and it's it's a really cool place. And so I'm glad to be here now and, and to integrate um, more hopefully in other ways. So today I'm going to talk um, about, if I can get this to work, let's see here. A little bit about the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station, uh, who we are, right? And how we can help keep seafood uh, on the menu, which I think uh, everybody's happy about, right? Um, so i start a little about me. Yes, that's me a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, I do like fishing. I love fishing, uh, especially in a bathtub. You catch a lot uh, with uh, not a lot of effort. Um, I think it's 100% in effort, so <laughs> which is good. But I've um, I've been around a lot. I have a bachelor's degree uh, in biology, uh, a master's in marine biology, uh, master's in physiology, and what the heck, get a PhD in zoology. <laughs> uh, and so that I've always loved the water, right? And um, I, as a kid, I grew up in Ohio on uh, eighty acres. Uh, fishing and doing whatnot and it just sort of transpired into just a love of of water and then finally the ocean and my career trajectory uh has taken me in a lot of different ways right um and so i have a lot of leadership management and strategic planning experience which is one of the reasons i wanted to come here to oregon but um i started my academic career at the university of new england which is right next to portland maine Okay, uh, and my understanding is that Oregon has named a lot of their cities off of other cities, and I'm I'm really starting to to learn that as I kind of drive around. But uh, so the University of New England, which is in Biddeford, Maine, just outside Portland, is where I spent most of my academic career, and there I really um, focused on the marine world. Um, we did a lot of uh, sort of riverine work as well, but there's always that intersection. And I was going through, you know, my my sort of professional development. Um, I started getting into sort of more leadership roles. So serving a, a academic curriculum committee. So what courses could we develop, right? In sort of marine and freshwater realm led to uh, being chair of what we call the IPUC, which is the Inter uh, Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. So when you're conducting research on, on animals, um, you have to make sure you do it the right way. Um, and that committee sort of um, sets the guidelines for that. And then finally, um, I served as like the chair of our um, academic uh, assembly, which we call the College of um, Arts and Sciences Faculty Assembly. And that was um, where I first got my real taste. It was overseeing, you know, all the faculty in the university. At that, UNE was really small, so it was about, you know, about 200 faculty for the whole school. So. That was a, a great, a great, um, great experience for me. But also, I really liked how I could mingle all my fisheries management experience, and so I served on all sorts of committees uh, for the New England Fisheries Man Management Council and for the um, Atlantic States Fisheries Management Council. And so, kind of like the East Coast, that's where I came from. That's where my experiences were, working in pelagic uh, bottom trawls. Um, you know, coast bottom trawls, midwater trawls, plastic long lines. Um, so a real good taste, lobster fishery, scallop, everything. And the big thing is that you have to really enjoy what you study, um, but you also have, also have to like to eat it. And so lobster, <laughs> scallops, you know, I, I live in the highlight. <laughs> so that, um, I got a lot of great experience doing that, but I wanted to learn the, uh, how a big system works. And so I went to Arizona State University. Everyone said, well, are you crazy? Yeah. There's no ocean there. <laughs> okay, your, your whole research is based on sharks and fish and all the stuff, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, but we were really close to another body of water, the Sea of Cortez, um, Gulf of California. Uh -huh. And really wanted to work within that system and our international colleagues. So I took the work I was doing in New England, continued it, and then started expanding um, into other areas, um, which was great. And there I was the associate director of the School of Mathematical and Natural Sciences. And 
that was a big step up because we went from a college of about 200 faculty to a school within a huge university of about 100 faculty, right? So I was really getting to understand how these big systems work. Um, and Arizona State has 80,000 students okay, <laughs> on campus, right? You get an idea of how big this place was. And um, I think another 50 online. So that's a lot of kids. So that it, working in that system really... I was able to really understand how these bigger universities operated. And from there, I went in and took my marine background and became director of the, the Interdisciplinary Blue Science Laboratory, or IBCL. And that's where I was really connecting uh, work with Indonesia Cortez, work in um, Bermuda, Hawaii, um, and, and doing um, everything we could to sort of push the marine importance at Arizona State in this, in this desert. So those really gave me some, um, I think, felt really good, an idea of kind of where I want to go in my career, and that was back to the ocean, right, really. And when I found out about um, the position here uh, at Oregon State um, to be the director of the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station, it was like a dream job for me. You know, right here on the coast, uh, a world-renowned, um, you know, Hatfield Marine um, Science Center, Oregon State is a, it was a perfect university size, uh, not too big, not too small. Uh, like I said, I grew up on 80 acres, so getting back into rural sort of settings um, was great. I mean, Arizona, you know, five minutes, here's Costco. Here I got to drive an hour, right? Um, so, you know, got some pros and cons. But it, the experience here, the, the opportunity here um, was really something I was, I was, I couldn't believe it was available. So felt honored to get this position and um, try to really hit the ground running uh, and learn more about what, you know, Coons is. So the question is, what is the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station? Does anybody know? You know, when I got here, I started asking the very same question to everybody else <laughs> and no one else knew either. <laughs> so I've spent, uh, I think, a lot of time um, re-engaging with uh, the different commodity commissions, um, different public entities, NGOs, um, groups like this, to try to really uh, con connect and, and look and, and engage and figure out how we can kind of work together. So I think today I'm gonna tell you a little about who we are. And I think, um, you know, in the sort of the blurb of, you know, this talk and whatnot, it, it had a picture of me pulling a shark shell. So I'm sorry that we're not talking about sharks. Okay. <laughs> um, I know. Yeah. I know. I apologize. I apologize. Yeah. You, you know. You know. I'll stop. I'll stop this now, and I will start a new one. Okay. I'm sure this. okay just for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. So you know, the the question is, you know, what are we? okay? What is the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station, or we, what we call Coons? Okay. Um, well, we were established in 1989, okay, officially, okay, we've kind of been around since the 1940s, um, primarily in Astoria, um, working with the processing industry, um, and sort of grew a little bit here and there, right, then Hatfield comes along in around 1960, okay, um, and then here come the 80s, and, you know, we started to evolve, and we needed to engage with different types of stakeholders. And in 1989, you had a group of fishers and you had some faculty members going to the legislator, going to the deans, going to the universities, right? And saying, we need to help our commodity. And that commodity is things from the ocean. Um, and we became the first interdisciplinary marine experiment station in the United States in 1989. Um, and people ask, what's a branch experiment station, right? Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, neither did I okay, <laughs> when I came here, but I learned. Uh, so there are 13 branch experiment stations in Oregon, okay? And each of those has a commodity, and, I've, and they're, they're in the red dots, okay? The two sort of blue-purple ones uh, are coombs. Okay, there are two parts to Coons. There's one in Astoria, okay, and there's one here in Newport. And so an experiment station uh, has a commodity, 
okay, and a group of stakeholders in which they work with to ensure that that commodity um, stays sustainable. Um, and our commodity again is fish and other things that come from the ocean. And you know, you've got some potatoes, you've got wheat, you've got um, grapes, you've got all sorts of other commodities here. Um, in Oregon, and I was blown away when I got here. It's like we're like number one for you know seed um, production. I think we produce twenty five percent of all the Christmas trees, you know, in the United States. You know, number one hazelnut. So we have all those commodities. So the ocean is important here, right? And that's why this, we as Coombs were established to help protect that that commodity. And it's kind of exciting for me. Um, and as we sit, right, in Coombs, we are the largest and most diverse applied marine research organization in Oregon. And that was another reason why I really found this job exciting is that there was a lot of opportunity here to make a really important impact, right, in a lot of our um, resources. And so there are two parts. You've got Newport and you've got Astoria, okay? And this is what I really liked is that we touch both aspects of um, the food that comes out of the ocean, okay? We're pre-harvest here in Newport and we're post-harvest in Astoria. So we kind of fill that whole chain, right? It's a circular thing. So even before it comes out of the ocean, okay, um, we're doing things to make it sustainable. And then when it comes out, okay, how do you make that better product, right? How do you distribute that product? How do you get it out? How do people to enjoy that? So um, we hit it from a bunch of different angles. And so in that respect, right, what do we want to do, right, as an as a experiment station? That's really to conduct research that directly benefits for organs, okay, coastal communities, okay? So by and large, you all are stakeholders, um, and we all want to work with you to make what comes out of that, um, that ocean and our rivers um, sustainable, okay? And then take that, okay, be a world leader in that, uh, to the nation and the world. Um, and so there's a couple of things we really pride ourselves on is one is that we want to be able to sustain the marine industries. Okay. that are here. They're really important to our communities, um, the resources and the ecosystems that depend on, on, um, those fish and other animals that live within it. Okay. We want to foster partnerships and cooperation with national, uh, national and international scientists, um, work, work with groups, Okay, like um, like you, right? Uh, fishing industry, the seafood industry, government agencies, non-governmental agencies. We work with everybody, right, to kind of solve these problems and solutions, find solutions to the needs of um, our environment and the animals in it, and engage in interdisciplinary research that solves complex problems, right? We always have lots of problems going on, right? Climate change, habitat destruction, um, the list goes on, right? Um, and want to be a leader in understanding how we can keep and manage our resources better. So um, I'm going to talk a little about Coombs Newport. Okay, what happens here, right? Uh, and you know, the pre-harvest part is pretty exciting. And we've got a lot of different faculty doing some really cool things, right? And um, one area that we kind of touch on is environmental and natural resource economics. Okay. And you know, really that is how do um, we as humans sort of interact with our environment, okay? Uh, what are ways in which um, the economics of that plays out to our communities, okay? And the professor that primarily focuses on that is Steve Dundas, okay? And this work focuses on things like coastal community resilience, okay? Big storms, climate change, how do we prepare for that, okay? Um, outdoor recreation, right? What areas, okay, are most used? Okay, and why? He just came out with a really cool study um, of how social media was impacting the um, abundance of people at our parks, okay, and at the coast, right? How's that impacting things, right? People are, oh, this is great, you need to go there. All of a sudden, 3,000 people show up to see this um, landmark. Um, and then how do we optimize um, this coastal land use, right? Um, we only have so much coast, and you know, how can we work together in order to, to utilize it best? Um, so he does a lot of really cool things around that sort of socioeconomic um, aspects. Aquaculture, 
We do a lot of really great stuff with aquaculture, particularly shellfish and seaweed. Um, and the, the pioneer really has been Chris Langdon. Uh, and he, uh, his primary focus has been oyster work and anything from, you know, microplastics uh, to prebiotics for oyster disease resistance. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and, and how is ocean acidification, climate change affecting um, uh, oyster and production of oysters for food products. And so he started um, the Molluscan Broodstock program. He's been the, the 37 years ago, right? So he's been here for a really long time. Um, and it's just grown and grown and grown. It's grown to a point now the USDA, USDA we work with the USDA um, uh, on this. And it's a really important for our community. One is that they are developing strains of oysters, right, that are able to resist virus. I don't know it, um, if you know about what's going on in California, but um, the herpes virus is decimating um, shellfish, particularly oysters uh, along the California coast. We can't import any here uh, because of that. Um, and for herpes, it's not like it's cold sore, it's, it's death, okay? So it's, a, it's very bad. So they're developing ways in which to help our oysters be resistant to that. Okay, and they grow out the root stock, and then they give that to um, growers here in and along the Pacific Northwest in order to make um, uh, their oysters more sustainable. We're also getting into seaweed. Okay, I learned today that there's seaweed that tastes like bacon. <laughs> okay, I I can't wait to 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 test that out because um, I love bacon. Okay, I probably eat too much of it. Um, we do a lot of work fisheries and conservation genomics. Okay, we have two uh, professors that work in this, uh, Michael Banks and Kathleen O'Malley. Uh, and it's very in the work that they do, right? And from looking at population genetics, our stocks mixing, right? And Kathleen did some work on um, Albacore and found that you know, there was, there was some little bit of mixing between these two northern and southern stocks, but, you know, not much, right? And that becomes important when you talk about management, okay? Um, they also do a lot of work with salmon, okay? They got a salmon slide up there. Uh, and, you know, obviously salmon is an iconic species here, right? Everybody loves salmon. Um, and Michael's done a lot of work working with hatcheries. You know, you raise them, you release them into the wild. And how do you make a better hatchery fish to integrate um, within the wild? Um, and so a lot of really cool things going on with, with this aspect. And just so you know, like I'm touching like top of things here. There's so much more to dig in here. And I'll give you a website at the end. And I'm more than happy to talk more about uh, this work. But I would really encourage you to reach out to these um, individual professors because and we all like to talk about our work, that's for sure. And they do a lot better job at it than, than I would. Um, we also have a group that um, are wonderful ecologists, okay, doing work both within the fresh uh, and the marine environment. Um, we have Dr. Cheryl Barnes, Dr. Jessica Miller, okay? Um, and we talk about marine ecology, it's a, it's a big term, okay? You know, they're doing work with spatial temporal models, like how is climate change affecting distributions of these fish? Okay, what can we prepare for? Which, which animals are gonna be moving out of certain areas or out of a certain fishery, right? Which ones are gonna be moving in? Um, and so that's really important when you talk about management type decisions, right? You talk about stock assessments and abundances. Um, you know, why are abundance, abundances fluctuating, okay? Is it due because of stocks moving in and out, overfishing? Okay, those are things that um, both Cheryl and Jessica are experts at and, and teasing that out. Um, but they also do a lot of work with um, life history, how quickly these animals grow, right? How quickly they reach maturity, how, when do they reproduce? Where do they reproduce? All really important questions when you talk about um, uh, being able to manage a uh, stock effectively. And then finally, there's a lot of work around trophic dynamics. Who's eating who, right? I like eating fish. I probably should be in there someplace. But um, in the wild, okay, you know, how does that look? What's that trophic cascade, okay? And when you talk about climate change and spatial temporal models and how things are shifting, okay, that can have a large impact, right? When you talk about um, um, stock assessments as well. 
environmental contaminants. We have work in that realm as well. And I'm sure everybody knows about pollutants, um, some of the um, issues surrounding that. Dr. Suzanne Brander is our expert. Um, you know, microplastics come from everywhere. And I think when I was in Arizona, one of the biggest things that I guess um, blew me away is they're landlocked, so they don't know how they impact, right, the ocean. Simply driving your car, right, that rubber ends up in the ocean, right? So getting ocean literacy and whatnot is a really important aspect of what we do too. But, you know, microplastics, they're a big deal. Um, and one of the things that Suzanne does is looks at that, okay, and sees how microplastics are getting into certain organisms, right? And then what are the effects on those organisms? But then changing that into um, an understanding, education, and policy change that might, might need to take place because of that. Marine megafauna. So this is where I fall into, this part right here. Okay. Um, and I work with uh, Dr. Chaylor Chapel. Him and I um, do a lot of um, work. We actually have formed uh, the Big Fish Lab because we like to study big fish. Uh, and it can be sharks, which you do a lot of. Um, there are a lot of sharks in Oregon, which is incredible. But the thing is, is there's not been much information on them at all. In fact, we put the first electronic tag uh, on a shark this year in Oregon, which is oh. mind blowing. You now we can think about it. Blue shark. Yeah, it was blue shark and seven gill, actually. Yeah, so. Is it 2024 this year? <laughs> I'm sorry, 2023. <laughs> 2023. I got ahead of myself. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, we'll put the third one on 2024. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's 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 been really interesting. I, I, um, if you want to know more, I'm giving a talk at Pelican Brewery on February 15th. Which Pelican? Pacific City. Yeah, Pacific City. Yeah, Pacific City. We'll learn all about our cool stuff and where these sharks are moving and, and whatnot. But, you know, we also do work on other species, too. Um, we're really interested in sturgeon, right? In fact, my a lot of the work that I was doing in Maine was on the Atlantic and short-nosed sturgeon there. Um, we're interested in salmon, anything that's a big fish, really, right? And we hit all angles. Taylor and I make a good team. Everyone here makes a good team, but anything from movement to life history to urbanization effects, um, we kind of hit it all. Um, I'm a physiologist, uh, and he's more of an ecologist and a behavioralist, so together it's, it's kind of a good good package. Um, Astoria, okay? So now it's the pre, that's kind of like the pre-harvest aspect of, of kind of what we do, okay? Um, Astoria is post, so what happens once those fish are caught, right? Um, I mean, if you were to walk out the front here, you'd see Pacific seafood, right? Pacific seafood is post-harvest, right? So we work with Pacific seafood and other processors to kind of figure out ways in which to better utilize that, um, that resource, okay? And so up there at Astoria, and has anyone ever been to Astoria, to that lab and got, got a tour? It's a really cool place. Um, so Christina DeWitt uh, is um, actually the associate director of Coombs, and she directs the Cebu Lab um, at Astoria. And there's a lot of really cool things that go up there. I was, again, blown away that, of, of what happens. There's a seafood analytical lab, okay, where, you know, the, the actual fish can be analyzed for chemistry and biochemistry um, and the making of additional types of seafood products, right? Uh, there's a seafood microbiology laboratory, okay, where we look at foodborne pathogens, right? So, you know, do those fish come in um, and what types of, you know, pathogens or disease or whatnot may they have on them? Maybe were they contaminated during the, you know, the, the, the um, processing um, of, that, um, of that fish? You know, what are better ways to figure out how to, to make that process um, more streamlined? Serimi. Um, there's a Serimi seafood lab, okay, within Astoria, right? Um, I love Serimi, okay? So uh, I was excited to learn about, you know, 
they really pioneered that product, okay? The making of Surimi, um, which is kind of mind-blowing to me. And then they have a seafood lab, uh, it's kind of a pilot plant up there. Uh, and this would really do like shelf life studies. So canning, right, uh, is an example of that. Packaging, right? What are better ways to make that product last longer? So from understanding the biochemistry, what's the nutrition of that uh, fish, um, what types of pathogens might be in there, and what are ways to reduce those pathogens, okay? Obviously, it's up a goose point. Uh, and they had developed a technique where, um, you know, they were, I think, pressurizing that, uh, the oysters so that they could actually, you know, had a longer shelf life being traveled or being packaged and transported um, to different locations, all down in Astoria. Um, so there's just a lot of really interesting things that, you know, connect this pre to post harvest, right? Now, a lot of what's doing there is interacting with the community, right? So working with the processor. Okay, this is what you need to do to have a better canned product. This is what you need to do to have a better shelf life. Um, and then integrating it, bringing those groups in, okay, to have training sessions. Okay, so it's really community oriented, really, um, you know, working together to solve these problems um, that, you know, are a really important industry to Oregon. Okay, I think if you look at just from a, a multiplier effect, um, you know, the, 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 the best ad vessel price for um, most of Oregon seafood to be lumped it all together, you know, it's about 700 million, right? But then you multiply that up, you know, you see there's a, a three-time multiplier. You're talking billions of dollars, all right, is what this is worth just in the food itself, okay? So it's important. So we do a lot of things, okay? When you kind of lay all these things out, right, all these different pictures and things that we did and do, um, you know, one of the things that I came here and, and wanted to know is how were we interacting with the communities, okay? What do we need to do? It's like coming here, what's Coons, right, to the, to the um, you know, the Trawl Commission or the, the Albuquerque um, Commission? Uh, they didn't really know, right? You know, COVID, had a lot to do with that, right? Everyone was shut down, we lost connections. Uh, my position was actually, uh, it took a four year process before I was hired, right? Gil Silva, who did an amazing job, he was our first director at Coombs, retired, Christina stepped in, and then there was a four year gap, COVID and whatnot. So we lost a lot of connections. And so rebuilding those is kind of really important. And really what we wanna do is connect, right? Um, to our stakeholders, to, you know, have the stakeholders work in our facilities with our faculty, right? To, with our students, the next training, the next generation, um, and then back to the community. So it's a circular sort of event, right? Of connecting everybody. And this is kind of really what we want to do um, is make this a really um, community-based action. And these are important, these cross-sector collaborations. Like one of the things that I learned since being here is that, you know, us scientists, we have our own ideas, what we think is really important, right? But when you talk to the actual stakeholders, okay, those priorities are way different. Um, and I think that's a good thing. And so opening those dialogues so that we can work with the stakeholders' priorities, right, and see how we can help those, I think is really important, kind of eye-opening to me. Um, but we need to do more of that. Um, and we really want to lead, you know, keep our blue coastal economy going, right? And make it resilient to sort of climate changes. And, you know, again, we are, this is just like a, a snapshot of the things that we've got going on, but an idea of where our interests lie. And so we're working with the West Coast processors all along the, um, all along the coast um, to really help with their issues with, um, you know, uh, the EQ, um, alternative uses of the products, right? Um, you know, believe it or not, a lot of our resources are underutilized here, um, particularly ground fish. And we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, what are some alternate uses for those, right? Um, pet food um, could be uh, a good alternate for that. We're not talking pet food like kibbles, but like high-end pet food. I'm just like sushi. <laughs> like, blew me away when I, when I you know, so there's there, there are those um, opportunities, I think, um, to be thinking outside the box, okay? We're working with 
um, the, the salmon commission on hopefully on a, a bycatch study um, within that fishery. Um, trying to think of ways to keep our products local, right? I was kind of blown away um, to hear that 90% of Oregon seafood does not stay in Oregon. It goes elsewhere. Okay, so how do we keep it local, right? Um, we got a lot of really good local wines. Why can't we pair our fish with a wine, right? Yeah. You know, locally. You know, hey, you know what? You drink this local wine, you can eat this local fish. It's great. So a tourist comes in, oh, this is amazing. Well, guess what? We can sort of package it up for you and you can take it with you. You know, so how do we kind of do that? Um, I think it's really important. How do you train, train the next generation um, as well? So developing scholarships for the for, for new scientists to come in um, and be supported is really important, working with those groups. Um, working with uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, ODFNW, you know, on studies. Jessica Miller just published a, a, some work on Pacific Cod um, and how marine heat waves are um, having a really negative effect on um, stock sizes, particularly in the, the little juvenile wild fish. We're working with California um, and their marine protected areas, right? To see what kind of connectivity they have to ours here in Oregon. So we're just starting that now, particularly with apex predators. So, you know, do our sharks kind of move up and down or other large species, how are they used in these areas? Right? How are they, you know, affecting uh, trophic dynamics? So, you know, a lot of really cool things going on right now um, within Coombs. We touch a lot of different angles we, in a lot of different areas, um, but we'd like to do more, right? Um, and we'd like to collaborate more. We'd like to integrate more to help, um, you know, keep our rivers, keep our oceans, keep everything sustainable, keep it resilient. And so with that, uh, I'll take any questions, but I um, I had to throw a crab with Armin, I'm touching this crab, right? <laughs> uh, this is my contact, okay? If you wanna know more about Coombs, okay, that's our website, that's my cell phone. Don't don't text or call after nine. This is almost past my bedtime right now. <laughs> no, okay. I'm just saying. All right. Okay. So my cell. Okay. All that kind of good stuff. Um. Um. Yeah. Happy to chat, talk about any of these things. How we can connect. I think. Um. We're really eager to do that for sure. Um. And you know, I could talk forever. I. But. Um. I think that. You know, questions are great. So if you have any, <laughs> the uh, Japanese do quite a lot with their fish stocks, too. and um, I've spent a fair amount of time in Hawaii eating fish cake. Mm. You know, which is sort of like. The sausage of fish, I guess. Yeah, I know shock not. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have you um, looked at what they're doing to see a broader use of our products? You yeah. the question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The question is um fish cakes, right? Japan. And what are we doing for broader um kind of uses for our products? That's where Storia it is that's their bread and butter, right? Is is developing those other products um, from our resources. We're actually hiring two um, two people at Astoria because there's such a need um, uh, for for that. I, I think novelness, right? Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're always engaged in, in alternate products, alternate uses like the pet food, we fish cakes, you know. Um, I, you know, I would love, you know, to develop, you know, a market where we could pair that wine, right? And, you know, people are, you know, you can buy steaks and they freeze it and they send it to you. Why can't you do that with the fish, right? Just stick a bottle of Oregon wine, some fish in there. Hey, that's great. I'm, and we'll go to look at ocean after this, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Someone online is asking, how do you interact with the coastal indigenous communities to work on this work? That is a great question, okay? Um, oh, sorry. Um, I'll, on the third one, I'll get it. I'll repeat it. <laughs> all this, okay. How we work with, with local indigenous groups, okay, on these issues. Um, not good enough, I would say, for sure. But Oregon State just hired an indigenous 
sort of represent a, a representative, okay, Chance Wide Eyes. I had a meeting with him last week and we're looking to engage much better that way, for sure. That's higher, higher priority, high priority for us, for sure. Daryl. Um, have any ideas about the we might be able to connect with? We want to learn more about um, the effect of restoration at our estuaries and rivers and those impacts on fresh water. Well, what is the impact? See, I remembered. Okay, <laughs> of habitat restoration on commercially important species. Um, yes, I would say uh, moat myself for one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I would say also Taylor Chapel would be really interested in that. Jessica Miller would be really interested in that. Kathleen O'Malley would be really interested. Michael Banks, they're all kind of at that interface. We also have other professors in our school of um, fishes, wildlife, and conservation. Scott Hapel would be great. He'd be really in as well. So there's tons of people that would be really interested in, in that interface for sure, right? Um, I mean, look, it's all connected. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, is the lab up in the story doing anything with collagen? I know there's, uh, as far as like, I hate to say beauty products, but yeah. like health products, like that. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, we do. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to. So, okay. The question is, is the story doing anything with beauty products? Okay. Um, switching gears here a little bit. No, no, no. That's a great question. Yes. Yes, for sure. Um, and I would say not only that, but but pharmaceutical. Yeah. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, man. So, Christina, her home department is a food innovation center. Okay. And so that department is all geared towards those questions, right? Like, how do you make, um, uh, you know, pharmaceutical products, beauty products, you know, uh, and take as much as you can from that resource, right? In a different, um, for in a different use, right? So, you know, you eat the meat, skin's left over, whatnot, can you extract something, you know, from it? And maybe it's uh, um, fish oil, I don't, you know what I mean? And maybe that's a beauty product or whatnot, but yes, absolutely, 100%, yeah, yeah, we, they do that. It's a lot, it, I, every time I go up there, I'm blown away, it's like, wow, this is, Hmm. Really cool stuff. I think you had a question. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to mention, you know, you talk about eating seaweed, but I look at, there's such a narrow band that actually grows it. I don't think there's any commercial way to really make it pay, at least off this coast. And I think it's a little too rough to make it a farming spot, too. But yeah. No, thoughts on that? That's a good question. I think, I think there's a lot of, if you if you were to look at I think interest level I think Sea Grant did a, a sort of little survey right most are interested in in if you're talking like growing out like like aquaculture things right uh, oysters right everybody that that kind of it's where everybody's real most interested seaweeds up and coming I think it's finding the right market for it there's a group that's trying to um, develop uni as a resource um, and they would use seaweed as the food, right? And so you can think of taking sea urchins out of the ocean, right? Kelp restoration, it's amazing, right? But then putting them in a tank and having, you know, growing those out, right? As sort of, you know, aquaculture to a certain degree, what would you feed it, right? And so you can pull the seaweed and kind of make it a, a kind of a, a circular event. Um, and that has potential too, I think, alternate thoughts on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's in its infancy, for sure. Well, what I see though is if there is becomes a market for it, where you can grow it. Yeah. I mean, there's just police around here, there's real narrow band, it's viable. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, we're we're actually working with the Port of Newport to find, you know, alternatives to for our our oyster repository to grow, grow the, the spat, right? Um, and then a lot of the land here is just, you, you don't have access to. Yeah, and so that land use is, is gonna be, 
you know, uh, an interesting dynamic to work around, to say the least, right? <laughs> Yes. Um, I'm involved with the uh, Keeping Well with Seeds with Rope Roll effort. Um, and it's actually convenient to bring up that topic because this next month is the Winter Waters Festival yep. they launched. Um, and uh, it'll be a month long. It's a combination of like workshops and restaurant specials um, all throughout Oregon. Uh, the launch party tomorrow is at the lab, uh, and I can give you information on that. But um, a lot of the, the seaweed uh, aquaculture, um, and I believe it's because of some legal mm -hmm. things uh, with cow uh, water use, but uh, they're on land. So there's a Garibaldi farm for the Dulce, which is the mm -hmm. purple seaweed that has a smoky flavor that sounds like it tastes like bacon. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the Travel Oregon and uh, Oregon Coast Visitors Association efforts is to specifically feature um, seaweed dishes um, and drinks and specials. Um, and especially this time of year where uh, it's challenging to bring tourists out and to do things. So, so there's a lot of opportunities, um, but at least as far as what I know in Oregon, it's all the um, seaweed uh, aquaculture is focused on land. Yes, yeah. uh, right. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But you know, and it's like an emerging, I would say, yeah. opportunity. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely, that's one of the reasons I was excited. There's so much opportunity yeah. here. Um, so, yeah. Stuff. Yes. Uh, it seemed like we're talking mostly uh, about marketing of the product, and this is really good information for the consumer. You know, uh, in, in your whole research, studying a big, broad environmental spectrum, and plus the uh, the product, uh, the seafood product itself. So, are you guys? Working on a marketing, I, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, sure. Yeah, it's it's a good question. Uh, we do not have a economist or a marketing. Okay. It's a major deficit for us right now. Yeah. So what we can do is study the animals in the water, right? Yeah. You know, and see. Okay, well, this is how many you can take out, right? This is where they may be moving. This is how the industry, the um, fishery uh, industry may be shifting, right? Okay. Climate change, things like that. Um, when the animal comes out, uh, so Gil Silva, he was an economist before he retired. Um, and you know, that's a huge need for us that we're looking, you know, to hire at some point, but that's where our, our emphasis right now is, is like, okay, how much can come out, right? How much, what's that balance between what you can harvest and what can stay in? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, Yep. Correct. Yep. And then when it comes out, how do you how do you not market it, but how do you prepare it, right? So that it it has a longer shelf life, or or can um be used for some other you know pet food or a, 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 you know pharmaceutical or or something of that nature. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So we a economist in here that can help us. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Yes. So I think what Cheryl was kind of hinting at around this, though, and we kind of all know it, is that like once you can prove that you can make money by habitat restoration because that's increasing the population size, then you know there will be a stake in the claim of yeah. why, why we want to restore this habitat. And so you know we're doing we're doing this with Midwest Watershed today, which is like they're doing amazing things with planting yeah. habitat now. As soon as you can prove that that increases the fish stock or whatever the demand is, mm -hmm. now you've got your funding. Yeah, I know. It always comes down to money, right? And and those things. I no, I totally agree. And you know, those are things that we would love to sort of connect on. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, look, experts are critically important, right? For for juvenile fish, right? A lot of them settle out there and, and hang out, and then go offshore to grow up and do their thing. So that connection is really important. Um, and yeah, we'd be really interested in, in learning how we can, can connect more on that for sure. Yeah. So you're tied in with the Commodity Commissions and I'm really proud that there's an adult one here, adult sustainability. But there's um, a lot of issues with um, non-sustainable use of water. That's sucking water out of our collect, for example, in the mm -hmm. summertime. Yeah. And um, the major use of that water in Newport is for 
two food plants, and every day they call up the food plants and say, hey, how many water do you need? But um, there have been multiple studies, including by uh, Dr. Pell's son, mm -hmm. about what can we do to um, better utilize our water. And one of the things he suggested, of course, was don't leave the water running when fresh water running on your cleaning lines when you're going to lunch. And that worked for a while. I don't know if that's still in place, but there's opportunities for recycling water, but there hasn't been any push for that in sucking the sleds dry in the, in the, in the summer. And um, so I'm just trying to figure out the nexus mm -hmm. between what you do and how, because you have those relationships with the product commissions and with the city processors, how is there funding? Is there incentives? Is there disincentives? Because we can't raise fish if the water's too hot or too low. No matter how much habitat restoration we do. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I know, I know where you're coming from. Okay, that's, that's a major issue. It's not what we, what our nexus is, right, at Coombs, but there are others at Oregon State um, that are in that nexus, right, um, about, you know, land water use, for example. Um, and so, look, there's, it, this whole component is, is definitely complex, and trust me, being here seven months, I'm totally getting all of that, right? Yeah, so it's a, it's a process. Right. I mean, obviously, everything's related to water, water quality. Right. We need good water quality. We need to have um, we need to have that. And there's no no doubt about it. So how do we how do we work to achieve that? Um, you know, because if you don't have that, then you don't have the fish and you don't have fish, you don't have processors, you don't have community. And so that's a really important kind of aspect. And that really. Yeah. Water. Water is important. So we could I could connect you with the right people that could help those discussions for sure. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm noticing that in your Astoria photos of oh, um, it's almost last thing can start from almost every single picture. Yeah. So are they working on sustainable ways of packaging? Yeah, those pictures are old. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Am I working? At, are we working on more sustainable uh, uses other than just plastic for or for packaging and whatnot? Yes, that that's all part of that picture, right? Is how do we make this more user friendly, world friendly? Yeah. Things that the locals here are seeing that are not the mm -hmm. They're going to pick it up on the beach. Yeah. That I yeah. think get also involved in the mm -hmm. That'd be great. Seriously, there's the info. Okay. I would love to set up meetings and, and just really get, you know, feedback, right, on all this stuff, right? My email, you know, definitely. Would love that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is great feedback for me. Honestly, you know, I've been here seven months. Holidays and all kind of stuff. This is the first time I've really talked about Coombs, right, in this format. So um, it probably needs a lot of work, right? Some newer pictures and things like that. But um, you know, the story I think is the same. Is that we want to work um, with as many groups as we can, right, to make change um, and the right change. And with your help, I think we can do that. Do one question online and then wrap up. Yep. Okay. You mentioned trophic relationships. Does Combs work on habitats such as potential effects of sea otter restoration as a keystone species to transform habitat and diversity in Oregon? We do have a project um, that is. We. The question is: <laughs> Are we looking at studies um, for the? Is it the reintroduction of otter as the keystone predator? Yeah. Um, we do have uh, some work that's investigating that. In fact, it's more of like the interaction of sharks and sea otters, right? If you introduce, you know, 
the otter, is it going to be a predator to help control, you know, keep levels sustainable? So yes, we are, we are. But again, it's just a very small study, a very small amount of money, you know, that could be a much bigger econ or environmental need down the road. Um, but we are, we've got a little bit of work in that area. Where does your funding come from? The, the, the funding <laughs> comes from, where does our funding come from? Sorry. Uh, diverse state, federal, um, mostly, um, for sure. Yeah, places like, um, you know, National Marine Fisheries Service, um, National Science Foundation, I'd say are some of our largest funders. All right, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you, James.